system uh, around open source. So with uh, no longer introduction to save some time, I would encourage you to listen into this and then we should map this onto Malta, and map this onto the other ideas we've heard today and see what you think. So, Kirk. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I have to admit, I'm getting over a, like bronchial pneumonia, I get it once a year. And about three weeks ago, I thought, I'm not gonna be able to give this talk, but I'm doing better today. So forgive me if I cough into the microphone, my apologies. I want to thank uh, Marsec and their sponsors for allowing the speakers to come here and do this. It's fun. My only regret being last is so many of the students have left. I think the most amazing part of open source in Oregon involves undergraduate engineering and computer science students. So the few of you who are here, you can either keep what I tell you a secret and get rich and have fun, or you can share it with them. I'll leave that up to you. Is it the top button or side button? Got it. I want to tell you just a, a the scenery here is beautiful. We also have beautiful scenery in Oregon. You know, we have desert climates, we have mountains, we have coastlines. It's geographically one of the most diverse states in the United States. And within a few hours, you cover most of those areas. But you can go watch rock climbing, you can go ski, you can go to the ocean and surf, you can visit the mountains. It's, it's a very beautiful state. Not only geographic diverse, we have clean air, we have a quality of life, fairly low crime. So we always have more people moving into Oregon than moving out. I don't know where they're coming. A lot of times now they come from California. They're migrating up. And our economy in the past was ag and forestry. So that were the big economy. Uh, over the last 30 years, that's not so big anymore. So it's moved to high tech and it's moved very slowly. And for the last seven or eight years, it started moving toward open source. Come on. I'm not good at this. Am I? I did the slide. I'll let you do the slides. That'll be easier. You know, one of the, uh, well, let's see, you got to go back to Portland. One back. There we are. One of the uh, interesting things in half the population, we have four million people, they live in Portland, Oregon. So we're very clustered there, and then everybody else seems rural compared to who lives in the Portland metro area. And, and it's a very interesting place to live. You have light rail, you have all kinds of amenity, you have the arts, you have a, a very interesting configuration of bridges that took me a few years to figure out, so I was on the right one at the right time, going the right place. But, it, but it's a very beautiful place to live, and it's affordable to live there, okay? You know, the, the question is, how did we become a global leader in open source? Relatively small state that's sort of off the map. You know, previously, uh, mostly small businesses. We have Nike there, but there isn't a lot of other major industry. And... Uh, I think open source is very suited to small business. That, that probably fits our climate. Okay, next. You know, Oregon and open source, uh, we like to say uh, Oregon loves open source. We had a prior governor that used to talk about it. He accepted the first Google cash gift uh, from Chris Devano. He had a news conference and handed him the gift. It was an excuse for Chris to buy a sport coat. So that was nice. He had a picture taken for his mother with the governor. It was a lot of fun. And I want to thank Google. They're our largest cash donor. And Chris made me a deal. He'll make an annual gift, make it a line item in his budget if I leave him alone and not ask him for any more money. So that the check comes in and I keep my part. But the state of uh, Portland and Oregon have both emerged as global or open source leaders since 2004. You know, the, the, our success comes because we built what it's sort of a collaborative cluster. And we didn't do it intentionally. We did it through collaboration. When you're in a small state, and you don't have a lot of large business, you don't have a lot of state funds, the university didn't have a lot of funds, you simply work together out of necessity. And open source was something we could all gather on. Also, it was our good fortune. We got an open source rock star that arrived in 2004, okay? Linus Torvalds, he moved to Oregon, came from Finland, wound up in Oregon, in Portland. Uh, if you want to find him, you generally, I know the location where he drinks beer and plays pool. And that's where I first met him, and that's where I've seen him subsequently. It's like, is he always there? And he said he's there a lot with the Colonel Hackers. But he has a special place to hang out. He also is, is named after our most famous graduate at Oregon State University, Linus Pauling. I don't know if you knew that. His parents named him after him. And if you ever get to Oregon State, we have 100,000 artifacts from Linus and Ava Pauling. And I've pawed through those, and I've read letters to Einstein and all these great things. And then I took the Peace Prize, his two, and he's, I think he's one of the only individuals to ever win two separate prizes. I held one in each hand, but it didn't make any difference. <coughs> I tried to take them, and they wouldn't let me. Next. 
You know, open source in Oregon, uh, there's a person I didn't want to leave off here, and I'll, I'll add his name. Ward Cunningham was the uh, father of the wiki. He also is in Oregon. And it, it's, it's, he's a very interesting person. He's one of these geniuses that came to one of our conferences. Half his beard was missing, and this half was here. This was short, this was long. And I said, Ward, do you realize you only shaved half your face? I said, I made a mistake. I put the wrong blade in. It'll grow out. I said, I have an idea. Go home and cut the other side the same length. It won't be so noticeable. Oh, that would be work. But I just think people that are that smart don't worry about those things. You know, it's like a guy with mismatched socks or something. But we have the Riley Open Source Conference. They decided to leave Portland, go to the Bay Area. They decided to leave the Bay Area and come back to Portland. They said the conference is most successful, most well attended, and probably the most active when it's in Portland. And we have IBM's technology labs. We have Intel's open source group. We have many independent open source software companies. We put on a government open source conference in Portland and Washington, DC. Next. We, we also have, in, I don't expect you to read the fine print, but we have a Portland open source software entrepreneurs group. And it was started several years ago. And all these independent de developers get together. And they all meet frequently. They share knowledge, open source, technical and business, even leads for new work for other companies. And we're a member of that. We, we joined so we could participate with them. But it helps create a stable resource for companies who are serious about open source. Next. The other thing we have is, is the state's filled with user groups, software user groups. There's over 70, and many of those are open source. And they meet, again, they meet frequently, they solve problems, they discuss strategies, and it's a good social thing for them, as well as there's industry benefit because of the, uh, the highly skilled people that come out of this. One more. You know, how did it become part of Oregon State University? Next. Uh, a little bit about Oregon. The, the school was founded in 1868, nine years after we became a state in the United States. Uh, we're the only university to hold the Carnegie Foundation's very high research activity in Oregon. And uh, Carnegie Mellon and OSU share a distinction. They're both the only land, sea, sun, and space grant universities in the United States. So we're very proud, but we're sort of a best kept secret. Not a lot of people, if they saw OSU on my shirt, people would say, oh, Ohio State. Oh, Oklahoma State. I said, try again. And they don't guess Oregon State. I don't think we've blown our own horn. About 24,000 students, and we're going through some cultural changes now because we started a program with a UK company called Into, and they were going to help us diversify the campus and bring in international students. Well, it wound up we've got a whole bunch of new international students, and they're all from one country, China. So about one out of every 10 new students, you look around, and, and we're having lots of bike accidents. I don't know if other universities have experienced that, but our, our drivers in Oregon aren't used to seeing so many young people on bicycles that don't understand our traffic laws, and they've been hitting them. So hopefully they're not seriously injured. But our, but our campus is, most of it's on the historic register, and that, that keeps you from changing the exterior facades, and it makes it very difficult to wire them. When I was a CIO, asbestos and old concrete and everything, we have like 900 wireless access points in order to get wireless across campus. Okay, next. There was a context in 2004. You know, we looked around and Apache and, and Linux were well known. Code development was not generally funded. Projects hosted on unreliable infrastructure. A lot of the coding done by hackers. And we said, there's, there's something missing here. We'd like to help provide robust, stable infrastructure to emerging not-for-profit or community-based projects. And we, they, you still needed the funding. We had to provide it ourselves or go collect it. And, and this part about open source being free, it's not if you're a service provider and you aren't charging and you're expecting other people to donate and contribute to support you. It doesn't feel like free. But we didn't set out to change history or grow what we've grown today. It happened. You know, I keep saying it's synchronicity. Certain things, just the stars aligned. Next. You know, at OSU, I came as the CIO because they had a budget problem. They went like 50% over budget, and they didn't catch the person until after they left. And uh, I'd been a public administrator, and it solved some other budget problems, so I didn't get hired for my technical prowess. It was for being able to sort of make tough decisions and cut budgets, and, and we did that. And one of the ways we did it is we adopted more open source code. So in, we were the largest Sun Solaris customer in the state of Oregon. And uh, in a brief time, we were not a Sun Solaris customer. We migrated everything to Linux on commodity-based servers. 
and we got rid of all the service agreements and fees. And that was just one example. Our help desk is open source. DNS management is open source. Content management was open source. Network managing, spam filtering. The newest project, and if you get a chance to look at the web, is Gennetti uh, from Google has a product that their engineers released, and they haven't really continued to develop it. And so two of my people said, can we work on this project and create Gennetti Web Manager on top of Google Gennetti? And now we've had 180 downloads, and we have a lot of people saying, wow, this really helps us manage our virtualized environment, bring up things quickly. Uh, it solved a lot of problems for OSU. So I encourage people that, that just take a peek at Gennetti Web Manager on our website. You know, the important message on all of our adoption is the university president started noticing that we were saving money with open source, started embracing it himself, started talking about it in every speech he gave to every donor, and it, it really made a difference. Next. You know, we started with hosting. We hosted one project, and we did it as a favor. And then somebody heard that, and then we had two projects, and two became four. It was sort of exponential. Went very quickly. Next slide. Here's a picture looking into the lab. Uh, we, that screen rotates different images. This one happens to show downloads around the world. <clears throat> and it's like a pebble in the water. A little red circle forms when there's a download anywhere in the, the globe. And it, the interesting thing was I said, is that every download? They said, no, Kurt, we have six and a half million downloads a day. We can't show every download, but it's like one out of every 10. But I still stand there and I'm fascinated just watching. And then I feel sorry for certain continents. I said, there's no downloads. No, they have a pipe that runs here or they take their internet service here. Depends on how it's being counted, but it's very interesting. Next. We host quite a few projects. There's about 150 now. The most notable new arrivals is we formed a relationship with Facebook. It took about three years, and we worked with their engineers, and they said, we're, we're trying to build a supercell testing center for open source software for the community. And we engaged in that and helped them deploy that, and they're very happy. First, their engineers used it, now our major projects use it, and it'll be released to the public. The other thing that happened is the federal government is looking for testing centers for open source software, and we're in the running with Georgia Tech Research Institute to sort of do the same thing that we did with Facebook, to set up a testing center. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. <coughs> the fastest growing community on that chart is Drupal. We are the home to Drupal, and uh, very proud of that, and when there's a download, there's tons of activity on our network. The, the reason I wanted the students here is the, our undergraduate computer science and engineering students, I find to be amazing, and it's an expectation theory. You, well, first you go over and you make it look like it's random, but it's not. You talk to the professors and they identify the top 12 students in the program, <coughs> and then you invite these 12 students randomly to pizza, and you, you feed them and you tell them about the open source lab, and then you invite them to apply for jobs. And our jobs pay a few dollars an hour more than all the other student jobs on campus. So we, we get these students that are really bright, really eager, and they, they do wonderful things. They do surprise you, though, too. They, we were the home to Firefox when Mozilla had struggles years ago. And we, we released 200 million releases of Firefox. The students counted them. And they said, we want to celebrate that, Kurt. I said, how do you want to celebrate it? And they told me. And I said, how are we going to pay for it? And they said, Google and Mozilla are going to pay for it. I said, great. So they said, I just want to warn you, we're going to do it, and it might get some publicity. So we're still number two on Google Earth. If you type in next, Firefox Crop Circle. The number one is the lost city of Atlantis. But on many people that rate where people are going on the web or the most popular sites on Google Earth or Maps, it's this crop circle. It was built in 24 hours. They had uh, Google and Mozilla pay for a helicopter so they could drop the students into the field with GPS equipment. They stomped oats for 24 hours. That was all stomped down precisely with the GPS equipment. And it's 220 feet in diameter. You can see it from space. Google paid and had a flyover so they could take a picture of it. And then we announced to the media that they'd found a crop circle in Amity, Oregon. The Oregonian didn't think it was funny. They felt a little had. And, uh, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> Somebody went out there and they said, it's a, it's a it's a Firefox. <laughs> but it, it's fun to work around students because of that energy. When they did 100 million, two of them had interned with NASA. 
and they told me, they said, well, we're going to call our old boss at NASA, and we're going to release a weather balloon with a Firefox payload on the quad. I said, when are you going to do that? They said, oh, a couple weeks. I said, great, go do that. Well, what happened? I went home that weekend. My wife lives in another state. I should have stayed because NASA brought a truck, took a weather balloon, filled it with a Firefox payload, and released it. And the person that found the balloon got the payload, and they, so I never doubt the student power after that. Next. You know, they, people ask, well, how do you do six and a half million downloads if you're a public university? Who pays for the bandwidth? TDS Telecommunications pays for the bandwidth. Thank God for them. We were struggling. We had internet too, and we had commodity bandwidth. But then TDS Telecom was looking for a bandwidth hog that was pushing a lot of stuff out. Because in that business, they're an internet service provider, you like to peer. And they weren't peering very well. It was all downloaded traffic to their internet customers. So they found us and they said, can we make a deal where we take part of your traffic and we donate it to you? And I said, yeah, I'll give you a tax donation and we'll give you visibility on our website. And what you have to do in exchange for that is like a gigabit of bandwidth. And they agreed to do that. Today it's in Chicago and New York City. Most of it goes through New York City, but it's worth millions to us over time. And it's been a great thing. Next. We monitor it in real time. This is sort of a slow day. When a Drupal or somebody does a, a big release or an upgrade, you'll see the uh, things turn red sometimes. And then TDS will just sort of take the governor off and allow us to use more bandwidth. But it, it, without the bandwidth portion being provided, we could not do the six and a half million downloads a day. I don't know where we would get the money to pay for the bandwidth to do it. So thank you, TDS. Next. You know, we, we, the lab started doing software development after the hosting because we wanted our students from computer science to have some real life experience. And boy, did they get it. They've done some wonderful things in there, coded on some great projects, learned some great lessons, and got great jobs. And I want to I wanna show you a video next to one of our, my favorite students, Sarah Cooley. My name is Sarah Cooley. I'm a student developer here at the OSU Open Source Lab. I am a junior this year in electrical engineering and computer science. I've, I've, when I first got here, I was working on Maintain just a little bit, which is a DNS program, um, DNS tracking program for Oregon State. Then I fairly quickly switched over to working on OLPC related stuff, so it's a one laptop per child project. Um, I've, we've been working on the media player. First I started working on the, the plugin for the web browser, so basically what I do is I'm the person that makes it so using our media player, students in third world countries could go on to Firefox and download a movie from the BBC, or not even download, but stream movies from, say, the BBC or you know, Wikipedia or you know, whatever else might have media content on the internet that needs something to handle it. I'd have to say working with the people has been my favorite part of working with the open source lab. It's a really nice combination of people who are passionate and don't know a lot, and people who know a huge amount, just staggering, you know, better than most professional developers, and are here because they don't fit into the nice college educational system, and it's somewhere where they can just play in a hands-on fashion and really get cool things done. The Open Source Lab, I think, has really pro the, basically given me the ability to go out into a work environment, professional development environment, and know what to expect. Having worked at the Open Source Lab, you learn so much about how to solve problems, how to work in the industry, how to work with other people in a team, how to, you know, you're putting so many tools in your toolbox, so to speak, that there's just no way you can go out into the real world and not use it in your future. That was Sarah Cooley. She got a, a dual degree in engineering and computer science in the time it would take a normal student to get one degree. And then she had multiple job offers. And she shocked all of us. She went to Microsoft. <coughs> and not in their open source office. She said, I thought it would just be really interesting. And the interesting part was, why did they recruit her so heavily? But she said, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go get a different experience. And she's doing really well there. She'd do well wherever she was. Here's a woman that wears painter pants every day. And there was this big bulge in it. And finally I said, what's that? She said, it's the book of knowledge. It's filled with obscure, random sort of facts. And I, <coughs> I read a little bit all the time. 
<clears throat> and I said, why? And she said, because I can. So I thought, okay. You know, but, but really different. And we, we have a new student now that I'm going to feature, not in this, but in future presentations. Emily, and she comes from New Zealand. And she was a sophomore in computer science, and she was very bored, very bored. And uh, she came over to the lab, and she's not bored any longer. It's hard to get her to go back to the classroom because she wants to stay in program. This is Sarah's car. I just found it interesting. I saw her driving this. It's called a Sparrow. They only made 355 of them. They don't make them any longer. And it has a 45-mile range. Hers does 90 miles an hour. The others don't. She modified it. And the other thing she did is she got it for a song in California and shipped it up because it was broken. It wouldn't run. And the car dealer didn't know. He took it as a trade-in. Said the darn thing's dead. And he got it off his hands. So she took it home. Her dad was doing something on the controls. He's an engineer. She was laying under the back bumper. And she said, Dad, there's a reset. Somebody rear-ended this car and hit the reset. She punched it, and it's worked ever since. So she got a great deal. But, but now a, a little bit about a, a project that it's got some national attention recently. It's been in the news when we were sued by one of the blind organizations who said that our, whatever we were doing wasn't accessible. And we've, had some, we've gotten some attention because we have the first closed absence of Google Apps anywhere in the United States in a school system. And we got that in Oregon for the Oregon schools. And we partnered with the Oregon Department of Education. But, it, but it's Google Apps, and below it is Drupal and Moodle, the content management and the learning management system. And we provide hosting and development services. We buy a lot of content. We, we don't create content. We populate it. Put it in the hands of teachers, 130,000 teachers, mostly rural, and students love this. And it continues to expand. It continues to get publicity. We get an Oregonian editorial once in a while saying the, the state spent a million three and they haven't given one degree. We're not giving degrees. We're helping the teachers do that. Next. Our new flagship project became Drupal. Dries Butart, the founder, had the server in his living room or his garage. And I can't remember if it caught fire or what it did, but he wasn't in very good shape. And he'd had a, a DrupalCon conference, and I think there were 40 people that attended. And uh, he didn't know where to go with the project. And he, it really wasn't built as well as you think. So we said, ship it to the lab. And we'll let the students play with it. So we, we didn't use his server. We used his software. We moved it to the lab. And if you're not familiar with Drupal, it's free content management, blogs, collab, authoring forms. Very, we use it campus-wide at OSU. We were one of his first major installations. It's worked out really well for us. Next. The part about the students, which was cool, was we turned these students were, were loose on it, working with the Drupal Association. They designed and implemented an infrastructure for high loads, which Dries didn't have. They optimized the code, set it in a totally redundant environment. They optimized the databases to reduce the load on the servers. And then the former Drupal student came back and just hired one of my managers away and doubled his salary. Because what those two Drupal students did is they founded a business called Tag One Consulting, and they do Drupal consulting. And Dries Butard has started a commercial company called Acquia, which provides commercial support for Drupal. Most of his contracting is done, or these two students do most of their contracting for Acquia. And Dries sat next to me at a meeting a couple years ago, and he said, you know, your students are doing pretty well. And I said, yeah, they made $12 an hour two years ago. He said, I pay them $250 an hour. They're going to make more than I am this year. I said, you're going to be OK. But it was, it was a great story. And then they've, they've hired several consultants. They do tons of Drupal consulting. And the Drupal Association said these two students know more about Drupal than a lot of the people that work in the Drupal Association or in Acquia. And, it, and I thought it was an amazing story. And, they, and they, they do funny things at first, like this Rudy that was in the video. I knew him pretty well. And he, he like, sent me an email saying, I'm in New York City for the first time, Manhattan. I'm staying in a beautiful apartment. Have you ever been here? This is amazing. And he's not as naive today. I was in a meeting with these guys, and they're, now they seem very sophisticated. And they're good business people. They're doing really well. But there was, there was a case where students took something and have made something really valuable out of it. They're in great demand. Next. I came from the, the government sector. I'd worked for a citizen-owned utility. I'd worked for labor and industries, workers' comp. And then I'd worked as Oregon's first state CIO, and I worked for a county government. And government frustrated me because they weren't embracing open source. So I hired the deputy CIO from the state of Oregon. She joined me, and we said, we're going to start pushing open source in government. And uh, we got a lot of pushback. Our contracting doesn't support it. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. 
you have to have references, you have to go through an RFP process. And we pushed hard and we made some headway, talking to people in communities like corrections and human services and different places to start clustering and building systems on a, on a sort of a national level. But we also put on a conference and we held it every other year, Portland, D.C., Portland, D.C. <coughs> and that's been uh, very successful. In D.C., they pay us to put on the conference, a group called Meritalk. They pay all of our expenses plus cash, and we'll come, <coughs> excuse me, and put on a one-day program. And they want us back. So it's been a good experience. It, uh, it went, we get an international audience now. The, uh, the, what, this is one of the meetings where we had the, the people from Ruby City in Japan, that, where the, the developer of Ruby lives, and, and it was very interesting. They all arrived, and, and we sent somebody over there. But the latest thing is the, the woman that uh, helped me start this was over in Ireland at a panel. And the Irish said, we want to put on a GOSCON. We want you to help us. We want to put on a government open source program in Ireland and open it up to the broader community. Next. Our engineering curriculum, our computer science curriculum, like the students said, it really sucked. They were teaching old software engineering methods. They had, uh, the languages weren't open source. It wasn't very current. And a couple of these students, one of them that went and started CloudKick, the guy that engineered the crop circle, I called him a genius. He was just amazing. He was also Oregon's yo-yo champion. And he went to the nationals one year, and he's like 20-some years old. He could do stringless yo-yo, if you can believe that. And I made him put on a presentation to our staff one time, and he said, I don't want to get branded as yo-yo boy. But he went to the nationals, and I said, well, why did you give up yo-yo? He said, Kurt, a 12-year-old kicked my ass. So he gave up yo-yo. But fortunately, he, he decided that the computer science department was not going to teach a stale, old, boring curriculum. And he went after the dean, he and some other students. And they said, we're going to drop out. And today, it's filled with open source curriculum that's very modern. And the neat part is the computer science engineering students have a production lab, <coughs> which is, <coughs> excuse me, the OSL. <coughs> Sorry about that. Drink water. What doesn't kill me makes me goofier, I think. <coughs> Next one. They started an education lab. The students did. They, they got some money from the dean and from the open source lab, and they wanted to promote student involvement in open source. They, they have a penguin that sits on a remote-controlled Humvee, and it, it drives around campus the day they're going to have their lug meeting. And then Google gave them a pizza grant, which I hadn't heard of before. So all the pizza, salad, and beverages they can drink, and then you put in the receipts, and they send them a check for the next one. So they, they feed them, which brings students out. But it also promoted academic involvement in open source software. Uh, it's been a great thing. They invite speakers. They're having a bar camp when I get back over the weekend. And it's a great place for a newcomer on campus interested in open source to join. They target women and people in underserved communities. They do that deliberately. We host a, a group that's called Linux Chicks, C-H-I-X. And it, it's founded by a woman who worked for Intel that was very frustrated about the lack of women in computer science and engineering. So they've encouraged that. In fact, if my students work on anything that's research related and they're female, uh, Intel under a grant pays their salary. So we go out and we work really hard to find some of these young women that are interested because someone else will, will pay the overhead and we can actually build them out. So I, I think it's a pretty good deal. The, the other thing that they do is there's something called Beaver Source. It's, it's a code and project repository for students. So any of you students can be invited to join. And it's social networking, it's Wickham for, forums, blogs, it's a project showcase. It's very popular with our students and others. It was funded by NSF. And uh, we're very pleased with sort of the success. And the reason you want to go here, rather than go out and try to contribute code to a major open source project, is you can have your head taken off by some of the people on the, on the, on the projects. Because some of our students went out and, and tried to introduce code or do something, and they got chewed out by people. And they said, well, I'm not going there again. So we have a safe place that they can get some experience. They can work on their projects. They can share them with other. And, and it's actually done real well. The reason it's called Beaver Source is the beaver is our mascot. That, that was the clever name we came up with. And uh, uh, we're really proud of the students because this was student-led. Next. When you have engineering students, they make things. So they made a Linux embedded handheld device. And the computer they made has about a $200 price point, a little tablet. It's not the most sophisticated thing. But every entering computer science and engineering student gets one. 
and that's what they write code on. And it's been a very interesting project. We, we got a bunch of money from Intel to support Mego on this device, and Mego closed up recently. We also were hosting a whole bunch of Mego. So now we'll have a, we have a lot of arrangements with Intel, but that was just one of them. But it's nice when they, you have people that can build things, you're nice when you have people that can test things, and then we have a production environment. Next. To summarize, Oregon's become a global leader in free and open source software. And the, and the cluster keeps getting stronger. We're having, um, the Drupal Association is moving from Brussels, Belgium to Portland. Uh, Mozilla's gonna have an office in Portland. Uh, they just continue to arrive. People want to be clustered with like minds in a like city. The former summer program, summer of code program manager from Google had worked for Google six years, Leslie Hawthorne, and I got to know her pretty well. And she contacted me one day and she said, I want to live in Portland. I said, you want to live in Portland? Yeah. Have you got a job for me? Well, we'll create a job for you because she's really, really connected and deep in open source. So she's one of my most productive, most connected, probably one of the best workers we've ever had in the OSL, because she wanted to live in Portland. She said, I, I don't want to live in Sunnyvale. I want to have clean air. I want to, have, I want to feel like I'm part of the Portland community. And she arrived, and it, it's been a blessing for us. The OSL provides staff and students with amazing opportunities. Most of my, I can't hire my students. They won't work for what we offer at a state salary. Generally, they get more. I might have an opportunity to hire two coming up. I can't keep the staff. They get trained, they get known, and they get poached by somebody else who generally doubles their salary, gives them an equity share, and pays them a bonus. And then they apologize to me for that. I said, don't apologize to me. How do I get on that list? Okay. There's just some contact information. And I, again, I want to thank you. I, and I said, the students, if you work in open source, you get known by the open source community. Our students all program in Python. We standardize the language. There's a huge demand right now in the Portland area for Python programmers. And they try to go to conferences and people try to poach them before they graduate. That's happened twice to me and I, I really get angry when they, they hire students and they lure them. One of them got a six figure job in California and he was just a genius, but he, oh, he'd only finished two years of school. And he said, well, I'm gonna finish it, I'm gonna come back. And the, then the sad part was his, his mother was a high school dropout that worked in a fast food restaurant in Salem and he was Hispanic, and he was first in class to go to college. And then I started to talk to him about that and how important it was. And he said, hey, I'm 21. Don't lecture me. I can do what I want. And then I heard that he was unhappy. And guess what? I called him and said, if you're unhappy, come back. So this time we have a faculty mentor that's working with him because I really want him to be successful. But his point to me was, you know, Kurt, I sleep on a couch at home. My mother gave my room to my other siblings. She thought I was leaving. And, you know, she went through all these things. And I said, I feel bad for you, but I want you to, to get back in school and finish. And he's, he's on track to do that, which I'm very proud of. But, but the students are amazing. They energize me. They include me in all kinds of things that they're doing that many of them I don't understand. There's some real generational issues. They, they don't understand that we have, a high, we have a security in the data center. And they had all these Nerf guns in there. And I said, why all the Nerf guns? And they said, well, because of zombie attacks. And I said, if a zombie comes in here, they better check in at the desk, they better have credentials, and they better be escorted. They said it takes all the fun out of zombie attacks. I said there'll be no zombie attacks in the OSL. <clears throat> so now we're zombie attack free, and I, I still don't get that culture. But zombies are very big. They're having zombie parties in Portland, and the students dress up as zombies, and then they shoot each other with Nerf guns. I, I, I'm not there yet, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Thank you very much. Kurt, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kurt, for a most inspirational talk. We, uh, we love you for it. Um, we can promise you from our side that we will uh, try to do our best to do a marine variant of this from Malta. Uh, I got a brilliant idea after a couple of glasses of wine from uh, Jim yesterday. He said, uh, why don't we stay in contact? Let's uh, have a Skype between all the speakers and so on, see what we can do. Maybe we can build a network, maybe we're building some kind of iOS community where we can help each other to make all this happen. We would love to partner with um, something as phenomenal as, uh, as your state. Uh, I'm sure the Maltese government would like to do a marine variant of this so we could help each other. And uh, with that said, uh, we invite you to the party. Now, of course, we have a practical problem because um, 
you keynote speakers have done phenomenally well. Everybody has delivered on time. The only 